So let's get at this. Um, so welcome everybody. This is um, okay. So this is uh, both a both and an and an experiment. So let's see what happens in here today. Okay. So so this is a both, meaning this is not a talk. So it's supposed, you know, to be like to to degenerate into a discussion at some point, better sooner than later. And so what's the goal of this activity? which as far as I know is new in Caldron, this never happened before. So for a few years now, some of, uh, of us, some of toolchain um, hackers and developers, we have been attending Plumbers, which is like a, a kernel uh, conference, which is very similar to Caldron in the sense that it's a conference for developers, in this case for kernel hackers. Kernel maintainers are there, kernel developers are there. They get together, they discuss about technical issues, very much like Caldron. So for several years, we have been there, going there, uh, some of us, some of us go every year. Some others come from sometimes. Like Sid, for example, was there last year, if I remember properly, in 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 Plumbers and and Carlos as well. And um, so usually we bring some topics there that are in the, of interest to the kernel and also to the tool chain. So then we thought this year, well, let's do it the other way around. Let's get some kernel maintainers in Cauldron, and then let's have some discussions there of particular topics which are of interest for the kernel and also for the toolchain. And then since Plumbers is next week in Vienna, it's in a few year, days in Vienna, then we can also collect feedback so we can continue some of those discussions there that we start here. Okay. So those are the topics, some of the topics that we thought could would be interesting. Uh, we know for a fact that on the kernel side there are interest in discussing about those topics. So how do you want to proceed? <laughs> okay, so of course if you have any other topic that you want to raise, now is the time. Uh, I don't think we will have time in one hour to go through all of this. So, but, so let's just start maybe with the... Where's the microphone? Static analyzer. We could talk about the GCC static analyzer on the kernel. Um, which I've played around with, um, but um, I, it, I'm hoping someone else will step up. <laughs> I'm sorry? Oh, okay. sorry. sorry. I'm saying. We, can, we can use this, but let's be careful yeah. to not break it. Yeah. Um, I was going to say, yeah, using the GCC static analyzer I'm the maintainer of on the kernel, and I, I played around with that, um, but um, yeah, if, I don't know if anyone else is interested in that. Uh, you are looking for topics. Yeah. Oh. Oops. You mean like, um, what's it called? I uh, can't think of the, what's the tool name? Uh, the one I always run um, that catches all the static analyzer that, like S matchers, yeah, constant Cosinel, but there's other, yeah, we have Cosinel. Well, Coverity. Yeah, well, Coverity, yeah. But the, um, yeah, there's a lot of times like I wish my user space tools had some of the analysis that like you know when I run a Linux kernel I could find. There's a lot of good things that actually when you run it will tell you like when locking's bad and uh, so they ask. Um, oh, what's the? It's not what um, is a snap. Uh, sparse. That's why I was thinking of sparse. Uh, is that is sparse available for just normal user space? Can that be used for user space too? Like in theory. That would be nice. How many people okay, from the GCC side are familiar with Sparse? A few? So Sparse is like a really nice thing that actually um, you can annotate. Um, like throughout the kernel, we have like, for example, RCU. Uh, when you use RCU, there's, um, I don't know if any, anyone knows what RCU is here, but <laughs> read, copy, update. And unfortunately, Paul McKenney didn't make it here, I guess, unfortunately, the creator of uh, RCU. Um, so RCU is a really like a, a way to do like almost lockless locking. Um, I'm not going to go into the details. Just think of a linked list that you could say, hey, it basically it's the, okay, the quick overview of RCU is this. Uh, you have like grace periods and coincidence states. If you have a, uh, basically the, uh, the if you have a linked list A, B, and C, you want to delete B. How do you know when it's free to fr uh, safe to free B? 
B because you don't know if there's a reader on B at all. So what you would have to do is, so say usually we lock the list when you have like reader writer locks, you lock the list for all the readers and then when the writer wants to delete something, it's got to wait for the readers to be done. The way RCU look, works is this. A uh, simple c c uh, scenario would be, say if you know that uh, the system, you're able to stop the system from being preempted, which means that no task can run while this task is running. So if while you, all readers were to disable preemption while it read the list, uh, at the end, uh, you know that if the all CPU is scheduled, you know that everyone's done with the list. So say if you removed B uh, from the list, so A goes to C, and then you wait for all the CPUs to schedule, that's the coincidence state, uh, then it's, you know no uh, reader has access to B because they have, you know, like I said, they turned off scheduling and they read the list, so you do it. That's how RCU basically, uh, overview of how RCU works. But the thing is, for using RCU, we have to be very careful on how you access it. You have to make sure you have these, you know, RCU locks around it, which is basically no ops. And if you don't have an RCU lock around it, you could have a bug. So you're accessing an RCU variable. So what we do is we annotate variables with like an RCU, uh, like underscore underscore RCU that has some magic to say that this variable is an RCU protected variable. Then like sparse will go through and it, it makes sure that uh, some, um, a lock is the RCU protection is around the lock. So by static analyzer, we could actually debug or find a lot of bugs in the kernel by just running these static analyzers and making the code safer. I think that's like one example. So if we had something like that more for user land. Uh, there's also user pointers that are validated like this by Sparse. Uh, I think we have also per CPU pointers that are validated in similar way. I've actually, in the mempool stuff I've done, I've added those annotation in user space. They are currently defined out, but there's room to add such valid static validation in user space as well. And another thing is probably more, I don't know if you guys have this, but say if you have a variable that needs to be protected by a lock. And if we just say annotate, say this variable protected by lock, kind of like how in the previous talk downstairs where they're saying that, you know, this dynamic array is protected by this size. And you have association with the size to a dynamic array that you'll be able to find bugs if it's not, you know, even at compile time. Would it be nice to have, you know, the code to say, hey, this variable is being modified where there's no lock taken for it. I mean, it might be difficult for having, you know, function calls and stuff like that, but we have things like lockdep, which uh, another thing I would love to have lockdep for user space, where we could detect, you know, locking issues here, where anywhere in the co code, we could say, hey, is this lock held? But it only happens, I mean, it checked if you enable debugging, it'll check it. Uh, uh, otherwise, it's a no-op and nothing happens, but that's just one static analysis. So just on the topic of the sparse annotations, um, one of the proposals for the, BP, the BTF type tags was actually to use them to, to hash define the sparse annotations to be attribute BTF type tag and to encode them in the type information. The problem with that is that the sparse attributes do not actually associate in exactly the same way that the, the GCC GNU underscore underscore attribute syntax works. A possible workaround that I looked at was using the C2X standard attribute syntax, since that's, that's more precise in terms of this attribute applies in this spot. Have you, you haven't magically fixed this problem in the last two years since we discussed this at Cauldron no. here two years ago. The, the, the magical fix is to use the C2X standard attribute. Yeah. To use C2X attributes. Yeah. To use which attributes? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they solved the bear escape before killing yeah. does, that, does that basically require touching every line of code in the kernel that uses like double underscore user or double underscore kernel? Well, all of those, those are all macros, right? So yeah. they're, they're defined to be. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and those, that's also part of the um, um, static analyzer. Um, Funny part, you mentioned the B, uh, BPF and stuff like that. One of the things that they just found out was um, the tracer or their verifier uh, on the trace points inside kernels. Um, the verifier didn't know that uh, trace point um, calls could have null pointer uh, or the right exactly what's called. That this is a new thing that's going on right now. They just found out, oh crap! Some trace points do allow to have a null 
uh, point or null passed to the parameters. And now the verifier says, oh, you're okay. And if the BPF program doesn't check it, it's inside the kernel, it does a null pointer to reference and crashes the kernel. That's kind of like what BPF is not supposed to do. So what they're looking at is having a way to just annotate somehow the parameters saying that this parameter can be null. Right, exactly. And so, the proposal is if, if you do that with something like the BTF type tags, then that's just in general purpose type information or debug information. So but, I mean, what if you could do if you had something like this for user space too, that's saying, hey, these parameters can be null and then you know the compiler will fail if you access, you know, if you could say start saying that this could be null if the compiler knows that this is being accessed without being checked. I mean, we have attributes non-null and as a function attribute already, we've had that for years in GCC, haven't we? Uh, I think it's attribute non-null. I don't think we have yeah, that. Yeah. Um, the other I'm sorry? It does affect, I think it's actually, if someone's got, um, GCC non, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a warning thing, um, non-null, uh, dash w non-null, and there's basically as an attribute, um, which uh, is unfactual. It's stored on the, if I remember correctly, it is in the type system in as much as the type of the function. Um, has the type of the function has uh, has the attribute on it saying that parameter two is non-null or whatnot. Uh, well, uh, is this thing on? I think so. Yeah, but because so wait, so that's saying that this is not null. I want to say that this can be null. Is that that's that's the thing is we don't care like if um, if you say that this can be null, then the compile inside the function you have to make sure it's checked or whatever is checked that that is null. Yeah, otherwise we have to say not null, not null, not null. Like, no, I'm saying just saying, hey, this could be null and make force that it's yeah. checked before it's ever dereferenced. Yeah. Will an attribute be the best solution for this? Well, I think part of it is that it's not just a null or not null thing. It's like they, for at least, for example, for the BPF verifier, they want to know those things like RCU and user and the other annotations as well. So it seems like something kind of general in terms of a complication a complication with the non-null attribute is it's both a warning attribute and an optimization attribute that optimizes on the assumption that the point is a non-null which isn't always what you want now we may have cause to rethink this anyway, since it's likely that C2Y will start allowing various standard string functions to take null pointers when a zero size is passed, and that will make the non-null attribute as an optimization thing invalid for these standard functions. But it's probably still a good idea to warn if the code passes null without a zero size. So we'll probably want, in that context, for C2Y to think about what should we do with different cases of non-null attributes. There is a, a command line option to force a compiler not to delete the, the null check. It, it was explained if you scroll down. <laughs> right, but it, but it still warns. Always. I don't know if the compiler already enables that. I'm not a compiler developer. <laughs> oh, the kernel. I don't think so. Okay. Yep, so, you know, should we go to the next sort? Yeah. Yeah, we have to move on, but uh, just one, one final thing. This is a, sh a shameless plug that I got the bug tracker for. Um, yeah, there's a particular tracker bug in the GCC Bugzilla for running this, uh, this GCC static analyzer on the kernel. And if anyone is looking for an exciting new project to work on, um, it's bug 106358 is the tracker bug in GCC Bugzilla. Because I've got it in and do it by heart. No, no, no. I, did. I, no, I have a psychic link where I can make the rest of the questions. Okay. So, I will say, let's move on. Uh, okay, so. Thank you. So, one topic that we have here is that, okay, the kernel, they use a plugin, which what it does is it gets the fields of the struct and then it shuffles them. I know. 
I mean, you should not be, do that in C, but some people need to do that. So, well, um, so now there is a problem which is summarized there, which basically is that it looks like the way this plugin is actually plugging in the compiler, it is reordering those fields after the debug hooks are actu have actually built the internal door for those struct types. Meaning that the debug info generated for the structs doesn't correspond as much to uh, what was reordered. So I think Sam, you, you found it. Can, do you want to add something? So the plugin is the bugging. Essentially the plugin, essentially the plugin is just bugging. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 there's a big bug. So the, the plugin situation in general is kind of a mess, right? Because they're mostly only in the kernel. They got imported from the GR security stuff by keys. Uh, and he did good work with that. But there's, there's a handful of plugins. One of them is StackLeak, and the other one is Randstruct. Now, the problem with Randstruct is, as Jose said, it doesn't, it doesn't interact well with when the plugin hooks run. Uh, in Clang, they added a front-end option for it, so they're fine. Uh, the issue for us is it showed up when we were wiring up BTF in Gen2. And we realized that actually the, the, the kernel marks BTF as incompatible with this plugin. But the, 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 the GCC bug is in no way specific to BTF. It's completely broken with Dwarf as well. Um, so as far as we're concerned, you know, uh, Fedora is building with Dwarf at least. Uh, you know, we, we're starting to now. As far as I know, you know, most deployments of the kernel are going to have most big deployments of the kernel are going to have Dwarf enabled. So if they have if they have Randstruct enabled, it's going to be corrupted anyway. So the big question is really, do we even want to keep this? I, I think the, the the benefit of it is pretty unclear. If uh, do, what do, what do you mean the plugin on the, the kernel? Plugin, side? Yeah. Well, that's a question for the kernel people. Yeah. Um, and then secondly, the big problem with the plugins is I think what was being said over there is essentially the only mainstream con consumer of the of GCC plugins is the kernel. Um, GS Security have their own. They have a bunch more. Uh, the ones in the kernel, as they are, again, no disrespect to Keys because he's doing great, but. The, the ones that are in the kernel, they aren't very well maintained either. Like, they, they don't receive many changes at all. They're somewhat proof of concept. So if we even want to keep them, uh, Arsene can speak briefly about that if he wants to. Yeah, sure. Uh, I did manage to fix the current Randstruck plugin so that it generates uh, debug info correctly. I tested in user space. I didn't bother with all of Linux. Uh, I just made a program with, like, a struct with free fields. Anyway, uh, the way that worked was just Generate, uh, just adding a new plugin hook at a more appropriate location. Uh, in finish struct, just before struct layout, I allowed plugins to hook in and then made the plugin do that. I uh, didn't post any patches for that because I never finished up the test suite and because the RAND struct plugin in the kernel does a little bit more, which I didn't verify still works correctly. Uh, but in brief, it was about a six line of code change to fix in GCC, assuming the plugin hook, the new one, is something we want to add to GCC. That's a question for reviewers yeah. more, uh, more uh, qualified than me. So what should we do? I just wanted to say in general, the position in the kernel community is that we want to dump the plugins completely. Um, you know, to the extent that any of this functionality can be moved into the compilers and supported properly as seemingly Clang did whatever we can. So fixing the plugins is great, um, but if we can get rid of them, we're happier. So what are the feelings of the GCC maintainers here about potentially actually incorporating this in the compiler? So I proposed that and it got won't fix very quickly. Uh, <laughs> but I don't know if that... I don't, I don't know if that was a conclusive position or anything. Um, if we I, get good, good patches to implement this in the compiler, we will, we will right? That's all there is to it. If, if you're finding it in principle, then. If there is any benefit to it, and struct layout randomization doesn't really have any benefit, it makes the code a few percent slower, and that's about it. So, yeah. yeah. 
maybe I can say it. So I don't use it much, but as far as I understand, there are some benefits if you want a hardened kernel. If you randomize the layout of your struct, it makes things harder to guess for someone who wants to take control of the kernel. That's yes. the that's that's main reason for it to exist. That is security by obscurity, yes. and yeah, sometimes yeah. that's used. No, no, no. It's, it's not really security by um, obscurity. It sort of is. A lot of times these um, root kits where everything, they'll know where the thing is. So it's very hard coded. So if it does it, so it's not really obscurity. They, it's not like they're finding it. It's the fact that, hey, it worked on this kernel. It's not going to work on every other kernel. So it's only going to work on one kernel. Like, uh, yes. So, so, in fact, the, wait, 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 wait. if that implemented and exploit will only work on one sixth of the system anymore. Yeah. yeah so. Account. My counterpoint to that would be, just briefly, that uh, it takes a sorry. seed. At, so least, at least one BSD has, has taken this to its ultimate limit and randomizes the structures of the, its entire kernel at every boot. Um, this has the advantage, it's not so much one-sixth of the system, they have to get all the offsets right. It could be, it could be one ten to the twi or one two to the twentieth of the systems. That sort of thing actually starts getting valuable. And if it, and if it works once, next time they reboot, it'll, or next, in our case, next time they recompile on a build from source system, it'll stop working again. This seems like a fairly valuable property to me, just like ASLR isn't useless just because it's probabilistic. So would patches be welcome in GCC for this? Or rejected straight away? So, <laughs> let everybody, everybody kind of settle first. Hey. Yeah. Hey. So, um, so one thing I want to mention on this uh, the the plugin issue uh, with the, the specifically the, the struct uh, um, randomization plugin, there's serious licensing issue with it. And what tends to happen, and I will try to say this as delicately as possible, is if somebody like starts doing anything with that, um, they get aggressive emails from the copyright holder of that plugin. Uh, I worked with Case when he put it upstream in Linux to try to mitigate that a little bit. But if you're wondering why it's not, nobody wants to touch it. Everybody who touches it gets nasty emails about licensing stuff. Yeah. Yeah. No. No. I, I just wanted people to know that. And and I think what would really help this issue along, whether you integrate it um, as part of the compiler or leave it as a plugin, somebody rewriting that from scratch who is not going to send nasty licensing emails when somebody uses it would probably move this issue forward. I, I know it sounds weird to re-implement something that's there, but yeah. 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 Exactly. <coughs> And that was that was that was discussion in the community community to <clears throat> add some kind of attribute to a structure to be able to have the compiler optimize the layout so that there are no holes in, in the structure, for example. So you, you wouldn't follow the ABI, but you would tag that that structure to say, you know, I want more compact uh, layout. And it seems to me just like a different flavor of the same thing. So if you, yeah, right, the, the same patch could even add different attribute modes for you know different layouts. And what happened to that proposal? No, it wasn't a proposal. I, I read that somewhere. I don't remember. Uh, I think it's something that the Rust compiler can do. Like you yeah. can tag structures with a C layout and so other, would patches for the be sort of considered in GCC or welcome or anyone thinks that would be a no no? Or maybe it'd be easier if that's not use that one. <laughs> You can use this one. So maybe the first question to address is that both of these bugs are saying that the C++ standards committee went out of its way to say that such behavior is, uh, such uh, reordering is not supported. It's non-compliant. Well, but this is for C. Yeah. Uh, apparently C++, uh, well. Okay, sure. I mean, but uh, you could argue that there are overlaps in, in terms of standards. Uh, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't really understand. I don't really understand the argument from from the standard uh, on this on this topic. Yes, yes, and uh, absolutely um, for for the this for conforming implementation. But presumably, uh, this uh, this option would create a uh, a dialect. Uh, with uh, with different semantics. 
Like many other uh, flags, yes. Yeah. Standard ish thing applies to standard structures. If you have a structure, it's no longer the standard structure. That's why your engineer is in well paid. <laughs> if, um, if I may, first, um, a totally unrelated question. Does anyone know if Andrew Pinsky is present at this conference? He's not, okay. And in a totally unrelated uh, observation, both of these bugs were closed, not, weren't fixed, by a, um, a, de a GCC developer whose name I did not just... Uh, uh, but he's not here, so basically that's where the pushback, the immediate pushback came from. Um, it, I've, it sounds like, um, Arsene, you have a patch, or at least a, a prototype of one. Yeah. Please, can you attach it to 84052? Okay. Wonderful. Yeah, which one is the wrong one? Um, so, well, no, the, second, the second one is the one I filed. Yeah. But no, they're both useful. They're both, they're both good. They're both relevant. So the first one is for um, the first one is for the general mangling of debug information by the plugin, and then the second one is me requesting that we do the clang thing, no. that we add a proper option for it. Well, I don't care. Which, become, yeah. I don't care which we do. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I guess I'd prefer a proper option because but, plugins. But it, it sounds like ha just adding a plugin hook that is very low, relatively low cost and uncontroversial. And if it, that allows at least the plugin to work, I mean, uh, work, that's a way forward. I think we should do that because it lets us punt on the question of, you know, the huge question yeah. of plugins. We are willing to slightly improve the plugin, even if it's a plugin and the general work. Yes. Uh, I would be willing to, with my non-corporate link cupboard hands, write that patch if that helps the kernel. I have no obligations to anyone, so I could do that. <laughs> okay, you volunteer. Woohoo! Okay, so we have to move on. Go into what I'm making, Sure, yeah, the prototype just touched that one, so. Hmm. <laughs> I mean, yeah. From a GCC architectural point of view, it basically locks us down into there is a particular hook or point where this hook is called in the way that structs are created, and hopefully that doesn't tie us down too much. Oh. Okay, so, um, so that is speaking so of the rest. Any reference on the ordering, or we just continue with the? With well, the we could we could do stack unwinding, and that's yes. Well, there are a couple there are a couple of talks on the schedule tomorrow for stack unwinding. Okay. Uh, so yeah, I'm not sure that we want to also talk about that here. Uh, well, before those, I don't know. Basically, it's now that the second version of the patch on the kernel side. Uh, well. Well, I mean, we're, right now we're just saying, but we're right now um, implementing it in the kernel. I don't know what, what's actually, I'm sure the things are being talked about, S-frames. I don't know, are we talking about the S-frames um, with stack unwinding for that um, for just the user space side, or do you want to know a little bit more about the kernel side of how things are kind of working right now we're discussing? I'm so, curious that the man that the kernel will be unwinding for, but is he? No, it's, no, we're using uh, S-frames by Indu, because it's dwarf is just way too complex. We can't put a dwarf engine inside the kernel. That's, uh, I mean, it's Turing complete. So, uh, yeah. Okay. For, for, for power, for power uh, we have uh, enabled async, unwind, thingy option, GCC option, for a bunch of years. And there have been no more problems at all with stack unwinding since then. And it costs like, a, yes. And it's the same on set. It's, it does. I don't know about that because the stack, if I, if I understand correctly, and I actually, uh, Josh is here too, so the or, author of ORC, um, who is one of the reasons why we do this, uh, we also have to have annotations for, to have stack unwinding work, we need annotations and assembly and such. So that's where things got to be really scary. I wrote code and I broke the stack unwinding it's, left and right, and it was almost impossible to get right. It's so, hard to write yeah. But, uh, but actually, we're starting to. I don't, I don't want to talk about stack unwinding in the kernel. Are you going to talk about stack unwinding in the kernel? Well, no, 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 no. Orc, well, uh, well, here's okay. 
We may in the future, who knows? If it's like, if it's uh, Josh Lake is right there, he's the author of ORC, the, the maintainer of ORC. So if this becomes like a normal standard feature, why not use it in the kernel as well? So basically, just real quick, to slash, um, why not use Dwarf? Dwarf, you no, know, because we've, we, 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 it's been broken in x86 forever, and, it, and I had to try to work on it. I struggled with it. Other people struggled with it. The ORC unwinder has to be right for patch, live kernel patching to work. So it has to be correct. For live kernel patching to work, it, can, we can't have any bad um, unwinders in the kernel, and the, and the ORC unwinder is too expensive to get right. So the, we needed something very, very simple to say, here's where it is. Basically, um, the way, all anything we have is two tables. One table is an address, a sorted address of IP addresses. You go to that table, you find um, the entry there that takes you to the second table that gives you just information to find the next return address, and then you go to the first table. That's all it is. Extremely simple, and you, it gets yeah, done right. And, 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 and it doesn't handle even 20% of the actual things that happen. Inside the kernel? Or in a real system? Okay, so Indu might have to be like so. Does because S frame does the exact same thing. So uh, how like how like twenty percent? It doesn't like what doesn't? Because uh, right now we're planning on using S frame. So no, the reason. Okay, what we're doing inside the kernel is we're going to because uh, to do profiling properly, we could be from an NMI context. We want to get a user space context. So right now we're just discussing having. Well, I'm not going to go into the implementation details because you don't care about it. But we're just going to basically having a tag or a cookie or something associated for all the places we want to do a user space stack trace. And then on exit to user space, where it's safe to do um, faults, page faults and everything, we're going to do a single uh, stack trace because the user space stack trace doesn't change while you're in the kernel. So one, at the, just before you come out, we're going to do a user space stack trace using S-Frame. So we're having information. The S-Frame section is a pointer to the kernel. The kernel has to, wants a very, very simple. So all it says is, here's the tables. And then the user, the kernel is just going to look at the tables and then bounce back and say, here's the address, here's the address, here's the address. Now, certain things that we might discuss later for pub, like some things for the, because the kernel doesn't have much access to a lot of things. So all I need is, well, I might want to save somehow is the file name for, the, for these addresses, like the file name, uh, a symbol offset, and have addresses off that. I don't know if that's, hopefully that's possible that we could do so that later when we read the traces, we could actually put together from looking, from user space where we have access to here's a file, here's the dwarf, and then we can even look at the dwarf information to find more information off that. Yeah. But it's, so, uh, first, first of all, sorry to drag you into this, <laughs> but how big is the uh, uh, unwind dwarf code in GDP? Jesus, open it up. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. A few hundred lines of code. Yeah, not big. No. Yeah, exactly. Well, it's spread in different files. If you can remember. Yeah, of course. Where's the mic? Where's the mic? Oh, it's here. Oh, it's actually here. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you're saying something? Well, no, I, no I'll, I'll just repeat. Uh, Diaz, how big is the the evaluator? <laughs> And, and the tables, I mean, is it a simple table? Like I said, it has to be a very simple table that it can be accessed easily uh, uh, mount or visible to the kernel. And so it has to be part of the ELF section. Well, I mean, it is probably part of the ELF section, this too. And that and means also, do we want to, how big, if we, can we get this by just compiling that? Not everyone wants to compile every single dwarf system. This is, and also another thing we need to do is um, just in time compiling. So we need these uh, stack unwinders for um, JITs. So when like a Python or something like that creates, uh, you know, compiles an executable and executes that, we want it to also create these tables and send a system call that it's going to have the same thing. So these S frames are going to be for created for that. So do we want a whole think, dwarf system for a JIT compiled? I, I think his, historically there used to be an unwinder, dwarf unwinder in the kernel, and then you yeah, it the, never worked properly. So you would know the size just by looking at what you had before. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think that this requires some support in DLC, in uh, particular. Okay, this is to read, to get the S or whatever it is, right, from yeah. the objects yeah. and system to the... Yeah, because we only need like the, uh, what's it called, the runtime linker, the LD config or whatever it is. The runtime linker too has to be able to pass this information, the S frames to the kernel as well. So when dynamic linking happens, we need uh, a system like the linker to be changed to be able to tell the kernel, here's the um, S frames for these, these new things we just linked. 
if I understand correctly, it's very simple information. There's no argument information, no return value information. It's just addresses of function. Yeah. Oh, uh, oh, and then we, it's giving it's, like yes. nothing. Yes, and actually, here's another thing that we might need to do, especially for the JITs um, compiles, is it ha may have to be dynamic, because a JIT could be compiling a, like 100 different things at a time, but can't do a system call for each time it does it. So these tables, they're just going to sit, tell the kernel, here's where the table is, and in memory, it will have like a size that changes, and the kernel will then look at the size and check to see if it was updated, and may have to reset. So the tables could change dynamically. Um, it's, so that's going to be a... But no argument info, no return information. For you know, from the system call? No, it's just well. Uh, it, it needs yeah. to uh, show in the debug table, table in the environment tables, uh, where certain where that's the first thing per instruction where certain registers are changed. RSP, RBP, that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's the first table. And it probably needs to follow the general purpose registers for that. Mm -hmm. So we'll be able to know the actual value. Uh, just, uh, I, I see a distinction between the case where you have a, a compiler-generated S-frame that you register for a statically generated shared object or executable, and the case uh, Stephen is talking about, which is JIT-generated code. In the first case, I mean, it's a fixed table, it's large enough, you do one syscall, you register it. The other case would be more like a dynamically growing area. So we may need two different interfaces there. Yeah, but if I can make two um, observations. This is the, firstly, this is the second talk I've attended at this, today where people have said dwarf is too big, too complicated, um, and, um, and we can't use it, so we've invented some, uh, a simpler thing. Has anyone looked at inventing defined subsets of dwarf that... Okay. Yeah. I, by the way, by the way, yeah. I just want to say I I was very interested in finding a bunch of information and writing dwarf readers and stuff like that. Oh my god, the documentation is like it seems to be tribal knowledge. A lot of this, and I mean the only way I got anything working was looking at other code that did the, basically what I wanted. Yeah. There's not documentation there. There's not. I think what part of the problem with dwarf is it's very unfriendly to newcomers trying to come in and understanding it. It could be great, but if you had better documentation or something like that. Yeah. I, I actually tried to write code to cut down Dwarf so I could see just how big the type tables were. And after it grew to th the, the code to just parse it in order to cut it down, grew, grew to 3,000 lines and was still accreting bugs, I gave up. Uh, just the container is a framing nightmare. I hadn't even tried to deal with the complex stuff like the expression evaluator. It's lovely and flexible, but... Okay, yeah, we need yeah. to move on. Yep. Um, but, but one last, let's just like yeah, just end up just because. I'm I'm not really like uh, familiar with the problem domain, but uh, why would we need to unwind both user land and kernel stacks? Is it like uh, for some processes that are owned by the kernel or like arbitrary processes? Arbitrary. Uh, uh, why? No, we're, this is for profiling. Uh. Yep. So you get to profile the entire system, see where things are long, and we're we're profiling. We're doing this on Chromebooks. Yeah. So, so uh, well, well, we have to move on. But does it? So, just, so for clarity, it's uh, getting stack traces are not necessarily unwinding the stack. Right? Well, we, we basically the stack trace right, is like is unwind, not the stack in general. It's just getting us. What, who, we just want the function pointers. That's all we care about is function pointers. We're not inside the stack. We're not looking at the data. No. no. Pro program counters, right? PCs. Yeah. Talk about yeah. Okay. Um, so, actually, I think I'm going to change the order because I think this one is more concrete, so probably it will be more useful to discuss it. Sure. And Josh is here, so it's a good opportunity. All right. <clears throat> so, um, it, it has been expressed, I think, is in particular, it was you, right? So for the M64, uh, okay. Um, yeah, so uh, for the kernel, we have this object, kind of object uh, static analysis tool that kind of reverse engineers binaries. Um, it's a long story, but um, basically it reverse engineers the control flow graph um, from the .o file and um, the problem areas, actually, it's actually pretty straightforward. Um, the problem areas are um, actually uh, de de determining when a function um, is a no return 
And the other problem area is figuring out uh, for, a, for a switch statement um, jump table, um, figuring out what are the possible jump targets. So those we know they're in RO data, uh, the RO data section, but we don't know how to how big the jump table is for that particular um, indirect jump. So we have talked in the past at LPC. We've kind of thrown, thrown around ideas about um, ways that the uh, compiler can um, annotate these two things such that uh, other tooling can, can um, make sense of the uh, profile. And how the information will be conveyed? I guess in some section. Yeah, so I, I would guess it would be a, a special section that has, for example, the no return, it would just have pointers to all the no return, the functions that don't return. Which would also need to be merged by the linker at link time, I guess. What's that? It will have to be combined by the linker. Yes, oh, yes. Okay. Go ahead, you use this mic because it's easier to carry this one. Oh, yeah, yeah. Hey, Josh. Um, but just for clarity here, the purpose of all of this is kernel live patching, right? Which is like basically ELF live patching. Yes, although there, there have been other use cases that have also evolved from this. Yeah. Sure. Let's say then pri primary use case is ELF live patching in the kernel. Yes. Does that mean like in user space, there's, there's, an, there's, there's always been an interest in live patching ELF in user space, but the downside in user space has always been that uh, it is just faster to shut the process down and start it back up again and not lose all the security hardening that you had in place. Um, but in the kernel, it can make sense. Okay, I just wanted to clarify what the like primary use case is here. Yeah, it's a lot easier in the kernel than user space, for sure, because we can control the environment and we know the source code. So we're looking for volunteers to um, <laughs> do this work. For the no return, do you actually care that the function really is never returns or just that it has some part that will never return? Like uh, if you have an early exit uh, which, which returns and then have some, some code and built in unreachable or infinitely right or so like that. right so we need to know if when you call that function that the code after that call is is not reachable right from that okay yes it's a new basic block after so hmm. problem so in other words not possible to solve that well as far as as far as the compiler knows right we we want the compiler's knowledge of whether a function when the compiler knows for a fact that a function doesn't return then it makes certain optimizations so that the, the, the instruction after the call um, is a whole different basic block that's not related to that execution path. And do you need it only for direct call? Uh, so do you need it at the, at the call sites or at the functions? Um, the functions themselves, not the call sites. Yeah. So, yeah. so if you have indirect calls, you, you, you just don't know? Um, uh, one one way to to produce it by the compiler uh, would be to emit it as as a dwarf extension flag somewhere in the dwarf. Would would that work or? Um, sorry, could you re repeat that? So emit in dwarf uh, an, a new attribute on the oh, subroutine that the function is no return. So our preference is not dwarf because um, not everybody uses it. You know, it's common to, to use it if you want to debug the kernel, um, but there's a lot of configurations out there that don't use it, and we would like something that would be hopefully um, orthogonal, standalone to that, from that. Uh, couldn't S frames be extended to do that? Like, just have address ranges and that like code in that address range is unreachable. Um, you mean extension to the S frame? S frame format. Format. Um, well, currently we don't use S frame in the, for kernel stack traces itself, so I don't know about. So like and that's incentive. that's still kind of an unknown whether we're gonna that's gonna happen. Because it is object tool that generates org right from the objects. Yes. So it will be like right. 
but it doesn't have to do that. We could maybe move to S-frame in the future. Did you consider an, a new ELF symbol type, no return function rather than just function? That could be a simple yeah. assembler directive and uh, um, almost no overhead everywhere. I wonder if that would break a lot of existing, you know, things that expect STT func. I mean, that, that, would, work, that would work for me, but. Uh, yeah, well, that is a known argument. The counter argument is if we never use the other types, they will always be unused. But anyway. Okay, well, it's an idea. Oh, well, so if anyone has an idea or anyone volunteers to, please contact Josh. Yes. Yeah. Okay, should we move on? Um, <laughs> if you could tell Linus that, then that would be great. There is a plugin hook done at the end so you can search all the functions and, and look which Yeah, which we are, definitely consider that. Which um, are no return and... Linus immediately knacked that idea, oh. but um, it's, that's definitely a possibility. But maybe this is one of those use cases, I'm, okay, right. I'm intervening now on my own, but where maybe a plugin is actually, maybe in yeah. this case, the right... Yeah, I could try it. Sure. But what about Clang? Did you manage to convince them to? Uh, the same problem, I think, exists for Clang. So. I was just going to say briefly, uh, and, and I understand there's other reasons not to do Dwarf, but special configuration is an interesting argument because don't you need special configuration for the live patching anyway? Um, yes, but um, this, oh, so this reverse engineering is done, has other reasons beyond live patching, live patching now, so. Okay, I th anyone? Uh. One more remark on the jump tables. You're only after marking them, beginning, beginning and end. Only what? The jump tables. You're only after marking where they start and where they end. Yes. So wouldn't it help to put them in a separate section? If the compiler did that, of course. No, because no. If you have like one function which uses multiple jump tables, it's hard to know which one oh, corresponds. Oh, you want to also associate them to their functions. To their functions and even the instructions, the indirect branch instructions that use them. Okay, so so it's more than just framing the tables. Um, yes, I believe so. Okay. I guess I tried to talk to you after afterwards. Okay, sounds good. I charge any US volunteering. Um on the jump table bit, so last year over the last year I've been working on something called SCFI, synthesized CFI, where um the you you could have handwritten ASM and the assembler tries to generate dwarf frames for it. So all the information that's needed to unwind from these functions. So we have a similar problem there that if the user writes a program which has a jump table in handwritten assembly, how do they encode to the assembler that this is actually a jump table? Because assembler cannot figure out the control flow. Same problem, but what I was getting at is if there are some assembler directives that we could come up with, I think it helps the case for both synthesized CFI for handwritten assembly and then the assembler could use these directives to emit the section, which I guess is anyway the way we'll go, but just something to consider that we ran into this jump table things just yeah. to sort of support more use cases for synthesized CFI. Yeah. I'm not volunteering, but um, I believe a GCC plugin that, could, that would hooks into the um, uh, final pass could walk the... Um, RTL for all of, um, well, as each function is seen, look for jump tables and inject into the assembler. This is, let me make a named label for the beginning of the jump table, write out the jump table, make me inject a name for the this position where the end of the jump table is, and then you've captured in the assembler, here are ranges, and then you write out another se separate section listing that data. And it all just works. 
and you just need, yeah, I'm not volunteering. <laughs> but I think it's doable. Basically, I mean, I mean the new symbols in the Hudson River, like Aileen, yeah. John Dable, Brandon, Green. But you don't call them the symbol. Yeah. Uh, yes, yeah. so we can because then look at the symbols and. Yeah, because you can see the jump tables on the RTL representation from a plugin. I think you're shaking your head. No. But the ball so shaped and that was where the jump tables were used. You were up into one. And this is. Right. I think it's been a while, but yes. I think there's still sometimes an ambiguity there about which instruction uses those jump tables. Yeah, like if there's if mm -hmm. yeah. So, uh, I think I may have some information that can be useful here. It's about the MIPS architecture, which I used to. Well, I, I still work on it to some point. So essentially, in the MIPS architecture, there's. Um, uh, I do remember writing a piece of code for GCC to annotate jump tables so that uh, uh, when you have a compressed ISA, uh, you need to tell apart instructions from data because it's, it, it, the disassembly gets confused. So I do remember inserting some kind of markers in RTL earlier on to be interpreted at the very end of producing the assembly code. Uh, in GCC, yes. So I think you know, if you track it down, it may be helpful. It may be useful to 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 to, to re implement whatever you need here, essentially. There's another GCC bug as well. Um, no. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is a feature request. Uh, one one six four eight. File having the list. Uh, which one is this? Uh, 116083 for the uh, no return jump table stuff. Uh, where am I? I'm lost. Ah, okay. Again, sorry? Uh, 116483. Okay. Okay, so we have five more minutes, I guess. How much? Five minutes. Five minutes? Yeah, so of the rest of the topics, we were very optimistic here. Well, okay, okay so uh, Sebastian uh, from uh, The Real Time said, hey, could you uh, basically ask me to bring up uh, Bugzilla, uh, let's see if I can find the number, uh, 87588. <laughs> this is something he complained about because I guess there's a case that he doesn't get a warning for an unused symbol. What? Uh, 87588, uh, eight, eight. is that on there already? 87588, eight, eight. yeah. Just, uh, he wanted me to bring this up because he was complaining about it because it's like, uh, it was not like if you have like a static struct or something like that, it doesn't, GCC doesn't warn that it's not used inside the function. So, because he deleted a use case and then he found that there was like a bunch of declare, like, you know, functions or variables that were declared. I guess it gets optimized out, but it's just wasting space. <laughs> so he's like, could you tell them about this? So I just wanted, <laughs> I figured five minutes. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's uh, the bugzilla. <laughs> Just wanted to bring it to your attention. Potentially, you want to find disconnected signal. Uh, potentially, it's not just one variable. If you think of it as a directed, the objects as a directed graph with references between them, um, you I guess you basically want to find disconnected subgraphs and eliminate them. Uh, or if there are disconnect, entirely disconnected subgraphs, then yeah. to complain. Yeah. Rather than keeping them thinking, ah, oh, this is alive because this is alive and this is alive because that's alive. And I'm not, sorry, I'm going to back away from the yeah. microphone. Yeah, that's what you just realized. Yeah, that's the case that it, there's throughout the kernel, he's found a few that's just been sitting there and no one's been deleting them. Uh, the problem with the warning is that it's, it's, it's a very simple front-end warning, so it doesn't do much analysis, and it just uses two bits, one for something is used and something is written to. So, so 
it can do the variable written but but never never read warning and can can look at, at the unused but uh, doing stuff like this is, is harder because then you need to prevent the bit from being set because of the uh, uh, initializer but others can be set and 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 be used a bit for other things as well so it might not be very easy to fix yeah i figured the, the circle thing is going to be like one of those uh, how how many circles do you have but if i guess it gets optimized out so i don't know if it's if you could do a warning later on if it's something's optimized out or not i don't know <laughs> Could probably do something in CGraph. Just uh, okay. So I hope this was at least a little bit useful, and uh, maybe we should do this more often. And thank you for the kernel people to come visit in. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.